This video is about function generators. It corresponds to chapter 12 of Applied Analog Electronics. Now, we've talked about function generators before uh, in the video for section 6.5. Uh, in this video, I'll be doing some review of that material, and I'll also be introducing some new stuff. Okay, first, what do we do in schematics? And there are two choices. One is, uh, the simplest thing is just to say, all right, I've got an external uh, function generator there. I'll just have a port here that is an input port to my system. Um, I've, if I have only a single wire for it, like I've drawn here, then there's an implicit further connection to ground. That's a very good way to do it. Um, you don't even need to show this one because it's, it's implicit. But if you want to show the function generator in order to show a test setup or something like that, the usual symbol is a circle, sine wave in it, two ports, one of which is labeled plus to indicate the actual output port. Um, and then this will often have a label with it, like uh, frequency, say one kilohertz. Or it might have uh, plus or minus three volts to give the amplitude. And there may be a DC offset, one volt plus or minus three volts. And when you have that DC offset, then this plus sign becomes very important. Because while sine waves are symmetric, if you have a DC offset, then which one's the plus one and which one's the minus one? Um, this one would be plus one with respect to here. Uh, quite often, you'll want to connect this second port to ground. Um, not always, but uh, most of the function generators you'll be using will be connecting this other one to ground. In fact, the Analog Discovery 2 that we use has a built-in connection of the function generator to the ground for the Analog Discovery 2. That doesn't mean that you get to use only one wire to connect up the function generator, though. It's still a two-wire system. You have to make sure that the ground of the Analog Discovery 2 is connected to the ground for your system, because they're not necessarily identical. Um, traditional function generators have another internal resistor as part of the system. This is usually a 50 ohm resistor and that's because the BNC connectors um, that are used are used with cables that have a 50 ohm impedance as a transmission line. Now we're not going to talk about transmission lines in this course so I'm not going to explain to you what that where that 50 ohms comes from uh, but it's important in that whenever there's an impedance mismatch where you have a difference in impedance between uh, a source and a cable or a cable and something looking at it, you can get reflections um, off that just like you can get whenever you have a change in, in medium for light. If you have you know, water and air, you can get reflections off the surface of the water. You can get reflections off the difference in impedance between uh, two pieces of a wire. Now, that difference of impedance, that reflection, is only a problem if you have wires that are relatively long compared to the wavelength of the frequencies you're looking at. So, for instance, if you have 60 hertz power transmission and miles and miles of wire, then reflections can result in um, either constructive or destructive interference where um, the forward moving wave and the backwards moving wave either uh, reinforce or cancel. And that means you have different voltages in different parts of your system. Uh, that's usually not a desirable effect. Uh, if you have very high radio frequency stuff, it doesn't take long wires to do it because you know, if you've got something where the wavelength is only that long, then short wires can have uh, quite a big difference in where you are in the waveform. Reflections then again can cause constructive or destructive interference. What we're going to be doing in this class is very low frequency stuff where the wavelengths are huge and our wires are going to be short. So there's essentially no difference in phase between the forward and the backwards wave. It doesn't cause any uh, constructive or destructive interference that we need to worry about. And so we do not have to worry about impedance matching in our connections because we're just working at such a low speed and with such short wires that it's just not a concern. We can use the model that wires are just nodes. We don't have to use the transmission line model, which is a much more complicated one. 
Uh, but many function generators have this 50 ohm uh, source impedance built into them because they're designed for higher frequencies and for the cables that are 50 ohm cables. Uh, incidentally, the BNC connectors are the traditional connectors used for oscilloscopes and for function generators. They look sort of like this. This is a board that you can get for the Analog Discovery 2. You can plug into it to get traditional BNC connectors. And with the BNC connectors, you have the option um, on the waveform generators of switching them from 0 ohms to 50 ohms, of putting that series resistor into the connection. It's not done with a switch. You have to move a little jumper over here between header pins. Um, so if you want a 50 ohm uh, source impedance from an analog discovery tube, you can get it. Uh, it doesn't normally provide it. Okay, so I showed you with that, that huge old um, function generator. Um, there are other ones on the market for hobbyists. For instance, this little function generator here has got, again, a knob for the frequency range, a fine adjust for adjusting the frequency, another knob for adjusting the amplitude, switching between sine and triangle wave, and then it's got um, banana plugs here for taking out the ground and either the square wave or the sine and triangle wave. Um, it's a really terrible function generator. Um, the quality of the sine wave is not good. Um, it's very hard to get the frequency you want with this uh, potentiometer. Very hard to make it repeatable. Um, it's cheap, but not really even worth what it costs. Uh, after I was disappointed with that one, sometime later I got a fancier one. Um, this one has a BNC connector, so I've got that, though you've, I'm just taking it out to clip leads, which sort of defeats the purpose of having the impedance matching. It's got a whole bunch of buttons here. It's got a microcontroller inside for controlling the function generator. Um, it's got a, a knob here that can control all kinds of different things. Um, it's more powerful than the first hobbyist one I got, but the waveforms are terrible. Um, and it doesn't go up to very high frequencies, and the buttons sometimes stick. And again, it's not worth the price. Nowadays, I use the Analog Discovery 2. It's got two function generators built into it, and they're actually very good function generators. Um, they're done uh, as a digital to analog conversion, so it's a sampled signal, but it's got a high speed digital to analog converter that's uh, 100 megahertz. And so you can go up to fairly high frequencies with this one and still get a decent signal. Um, I would say that you can go up to 10 megahertz signals and get uh, decent signals. Now, if you need much higher frequencies than that, you're going to need a better function generator. But you can do everything in this course, certainly, with that and any sort of audio work and even low frequency radio work with uh, just the function generator that's built into this. The tables, um, what, it, what it does is table lookup to get the function that it puts out. And the tables that it uses um, are uh, 4K, that is 4096 entries in the table. So you can get pretty fine spacing of that. Uh, it means you can get a, a sine wave that's high quality sine wave. Um, and the resolution of the digital analog converter is 14 bits, which is pretty good for that speed. Um, and again, that means fairly low noise from the digitization. So you get clean signals coming out of this. Uh, the step size for the signals depends on how big a signal you're putting out. If you have less than uh, amplitude of less than 1.25 volts, um, it uses a step size of 166 microvolts, which is a fairly small step. Um, and if you're going larger than 1.25 volts, you can go up to plus or minus 5 volts for the amplitude, um, then you have a step size of 665 microvolts. So maybe I can write those numbers down. They're in the book, but so that's 166 microvolts for uh, less than 1.25 volts and uh, 665 I believe it is microvolts for less than 
5 volts on the amplitude. There's also a DC offset. And one of the cool things about this one is the DC offset is not done just by, not done just digitally. There's an analog addition being done. And so there's a separate uh, digital analog converter with a step size, I think it's of 672 volts, microvolts, um, for the DC offset. So you can be having a fairly small, high precision signal here with a DC offset added to it. Um, and still get high precision on the small signal, even with a DC offset. Now, you are limited to uh, uh, minus 5 volts to plus 5 volt range, even with a DC offset. So if you specify a large signal and try and do a DC offset, then you may end up clipping, because it, it'll definitely clip whatever you're doing to a minus 5 volt to plus 5 volt range. OK, um, let's take a look at um, using uh, waveforms to generate a signal with this. Uh, what I've got here is uh, the yellow wire here is waveform generator 1, the black wire is ground, I've got those hooked up to channel 1 and uh, the negative lead for channel 1 since it's a differential uh, channel uh, just to look at what's the output of the waveform on the oscilloscope. The waveform generator 2 is another wire here, it's the yellow and white striped wire. A little hard to see on the video. Okay, so I've got this thing set up right now for the waveform generator. You can actually change the wavetable size. Um, if you go to um, the device manager and settings, it'll bring up something like this, and the default one says you're going to have two wavetables, that's for the two waveform generators, of 4K bytes, or 4K words each. Um, but there are other choices there. You can ask for higher, you can use more of the memory for doing the waveform generator, but then you end up with less of the memory available for the oscilloscope. Um, you can also specify uh, less memory for the waveform generator in order to get more wave more memory for the oscilloscope. So there's some trade-offs you can do on that, and there's uh, quite a few trade-offs uh, available on that. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that one alone uh, with standard default 4K. Uh, the table for this, uh, you can either specify in the simple setting, which is what we usually use, as a sine wave, the square wave triangle, ramp up, ramp down, noise, pulse, um, those are not done really with a table, or at least they don't need to be. They can be done as a computation. Um, I suspect that it just uses the table anyway because it's got the table there. Um, you can, by using custom, create your own wavetable here. Um, and so you can make any waveform shape that fits within the 4K samples. Um, we don't really have any need for that in this course, but you can play with that if you want. You can also import a sample from uh, externally and play it back. And again, you're limited to the wavetable size. Uh, there's several fancy features available here, like sweep, where you can change the frequency and change the amplitude as you uh, play. And you can say, okay, I want to take uh, 10 milliseconds to go from 1 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz. Um, or maybe it would make more sense to say I take uh, 100 milliseconds to do that. And it looks a little messy here because uh, it doesn't have the... Uh, the sampling on the screen to show you what's really going on. It actually produces a clean waveform, but you can't see it with this few pixels. Again, we don't use the sweep for anything in this course. Uh, the things that, for which sweep would traditionally be used are not particularly relevant to this class, um, or uh, the analog discovery 2 actually provides better ways of getting that. So you can switch the uh, frequency of the uh, waveform generator under sort of program control rather than just having a smooth sweep.
There's also modulation choices where you have the frequency changing uh, under the control of another waveform, that's frequency modulation, or the amplitude changing under the control of another waveform, that's amplitude modulation. And these get used a lot in traditional electronics courses uh, because radio communications, traditionally, a lot of it was done with frequency modulation and amplitude modulation, so understanding that it's nice to have a waveform generator that can actually produce it. Again, we're not going to need that for this class. Um, we're going to be using just the simple stuff. And the most important ones are the sine wave, the ramps, and sometimes we'll use pulse, which is kind of like a square wave, except it only goes between zero and the amplitude. Notice that the amplitude is one volt and it's going between zero and one volt. Whereas if we did the square wave, it's symmetric going between minus one volt and plus one volt. So square wave and pulse are kind of the same wave shape, but the pulse gives you a way to say, hey, I want to go between zero and a high voltage. And that's sort of what digital signals do. So that's it's handy to be able to have that pulse waveform. We also sometimes use random noise. Um, and this is not a repeating thing or not a quickly repeating thing. And that can be useful sometimes also. Okay, let's go back to sine wave because that's sort of the canonical thing that all function generators do. Uh, you can specify the frequency and you can either uh, type it in here in this box or there's pull down things that can get you some of the standard popular values. So one kilohertz is easily selected. Uh, the period is one over the frequency. So you specify one of these, the other one comes along for free. So if I change this period to be um, 10 milliseconds, that would change the frequency to 100 hertz. Um, and it's easy to change it either way. Amplitude, this is notice one volt here means between plus one volt and minus one volt. So this is plus or minus this much. If I want to put an offset on that, I can. Um, and again, I've got here, I added a one volt offset and nothing looks like it changed on the screen unless you look way over here and you see that this is now centered at one volt rather than at zero volts. Uh, symmetry here, that's not something you usually play with much on the sine wave, but uh, for some of the other waveforms like the pulse, uh, the symmetry here is the duty cycle, so how much of the time it's high. So if I went to a 90% duty cycle there, it'd be high for 90% of the period. Um, phase is where it is at time zero. And again, we usually won't play, be having any need to play with that. So let's go back to sine wave and back to 50%. Okay, if we look at this thing, uh, we need to run it. And now notice that this is uh, wavetable one, channel one that I'm doing. So that's the one that I was looking at. Go over to the scope and run the scope and here is flickering back and forth and that's because I'm triggering on the rising edge at zero but I didn't have the thing centered at zero. If I change that to be sent, uh, triggering at one volt now it's always triggering in the same place and I get a nice steady waveform here so that I have triggering here, that's the big arrow up here um, and I can see that I'm getting the frequency that I specified here. Um, it is possible to do all kinds of different things with the function generator and you'll probably want to play around a bit with it when you're um, dealing with it, um, but we're not using anywhere near the full power of the function generator in this class. Uh, we could have gotten by with one of the traditional old function generators for much of what we're doing. Uh, but some of the stuff we're doing, particularly in the second half of the class, where we're going to be doing um, impedance spectroscopy, for instance, it's really much nicer to have a programmable, highly controllable function generator that's coupled with the oscilloscope. And so the Analog Discovery 2 makes that pretty easy to do. All right, that's probably enough on function generators for today.